10 most useless NWO members of all time. The following announcement has been paid for by the New World Order. Number 10, David Flair. In the late 90s, WCW were hesitant on making David Flair a major name. David Flair, who was the son of in-ring great Ric Flair, struggled to connect with the crowd as Flair was awkward in the ring and he always looked absolutely terrified in front of a live audience. In 1999, Flair's push would be furthered when he would become an associate of the NWO. At this point in 1999, the NWO stable was basically a novelty act in the company, yet nevertheless, it was disappointed to see how far the group had fallen. Once WCW realized that Flair as a member of the NWO wasn't going to work, Flair would be relegated to the hardcore division where he surprisingly had the most successful run of his career as his work with Crowbar and Daphne was mildly entertaining. Number 9. Ron and Don Harris NWO 2000 was a last ditch attempt to recapture the magic of the initial NWO angle. The problem was that including names such as Ron and Don Harris wasn't the way to go about it. The two would join the group as enforcers for Jeff Jarrett and the fans had zero interest in seeing the Harris brothers in action. Their matches and segments were often met with utter silence and whilst it was understandable that WCW wanted enforcers for the faction, Ron and Don Harris were not the men for the job. Number 8. Disco Inferno For most of his run in WCW, Disco Inferno was presented as a comedic act. Therefore, when WCW tried to book the dancing wrestler as an affiliate for the NWO Wolfpack, it wasn't received well. Inferno's inclusion was just too far in the opposite direction as to what fans won in the stable and although Inferno has often claimed that this time of his career was his personal career highlight, it certainly wasn't a highlight for the WCW fans watching at home. Number 7. Nick Patrick Having a referee join the top faction of wrestling company is always a risky move, yet WCW did this the exact thing during the early stages of the NWO. Patrick played the role of a crooked referee and he always called matches in favor of the NWO members. Even though it was kind of a cool idea, Patrick was over the top in the role and his antics were comedic in nature which didn't really fit in with the theme of the stable at the time. Patrick would eventually be booted from the group after counting a pinfall on NWO member Macho Man Randy Savage. His inclusion in the faction was a clear sign that WCW was going to let anyone in the group and it didn't matter if they were a referee or wrestler and this would unfortunately be a trend that would continue until the very end of the notable faction. Number 6. Tylene Buck For most wrestling fans, particularly new wrestling fans, probably have zero idea who Tylene Buck is. Buck would be labelled as an NWO girl as opposed to a Nitro girl and would often come to the ring with members of the NWO. When Buck's stint in this role was over, she would transition into a backstage interviewer before becoming a member of the Misfits in action. In a rare interview, Buck would be interviewed by Crimson Mask and this is what she had to say in relation to being a member of the MWO faction. At first it was nice, it was fun to get into WCW, but it wasn't the way I wanted to be used the whole time, just like a fluff girl. I wanted to be more involved to get into the ring. It was good to get started, but I wanted more. I probably did that for 4 months and our storyline was played out. I sat at home and then they gave me a call and they asked me if I had combat boots, camouflage, this and that. I'm like, no, what are you thinking? They say, bring the boots, we have the rest of the outfit. That following week, I went into the show. They said, here are the guys you'll work with. Hugh Morris, Lash LaRue, Chavo Guerrero Jr., Van Hammer was with us at the time and they're like, you're going to be MIA, misfits in action. Number 5. Horace Hogan when WCW hired the real-life nephew of Hulk Hogan, it was only a matter of time before he became a prominent fixture on WCW television. In a dark storyline, Hogan would claim that Horace was the son of his deceased brother and he was going to show his love for the family by awarding Horace a spot in the NWO. When Hogan declared this in a shocking turn of events, Hogan would brutalize his own nephew with a steel chair and he even threw him off a stretcher. Despite being attacked by his uncle, Horace would become an official member of the NWO faction at the Halloween Havoc pay-per-view in 98, as Horace assisted Hogan in his match with the Warrior. From this point onwards, Horace would wrestle numerous matches for the faction, yet the crowd lacked any emotional investment in Horace, and his in-ring work wasn't exactly the best. While it was certainly appreciative that for once WCW put some effort into the logic behind a new member of the faction, the execution was horrible. The character motivations for Horace joining the stable were nonsensical, and it was hardly a surprise that during Horace's entire stint in the company that the crowd never once remotely cared about anything he did. Number 4. Dusty Rhodes Dusty Rhodes is a certified legend within the wrestling industry, yet his placement in the NWO faction was a booking move that really didn't work. 
Whilst Rhodes working as a part of the iconic faction was passable, at the point of his career not a single person had a desire to boo Rhodes in any capacity. The actual heel turn of Rhodes took place at the sold out pay per view in 1998. In a truly shocking moment, Rhodes revealed that he was wearing an NWO shirt, and after the initial shock of the moment, fans instantly began to question the logic and wonder if Rhodes was the right fit for the group. According to Eric Bischoff, Scott Hall had a ton of respect and love for Rhodes, and he was pushing for Rhodes to be in the faction, and everyone else just went along with it. Number 3. Mr. Wall Street A micro tender who was known as IRS in WWE would become a member of the NWO in late 1996. Rotunda, who is now using the generic name of Mr. Wall Street, would be offered a membership by his former tag team partner Ted DiBiase. While this made sense from a continuity perspective, Wall Street wasn't a major name like the other members of the group, and this likely explained why he was placed in the lower mid card. Wall Street was brought into the faction with no meaningful direction, and this was during the peak of the faction, meaning that WCW had no reason to place random and unwarranted members of the roster into the group. Number 2. The Disciple while Brutus Beefcake had great success in WWE, the same can't be said for his time in WCW. Every character that Beefcake portrayed in WCW completely flopped, and when Beefcake joined the NWO, predominantly due to his relationship with Hulk Hogan, he yet again watered down the group. Beefcake would be known as the Disciple and would be portrayed as Hulk Hogan's bodyguard. The new NWO member would wear biker attire and just like every other character he had in WCW, it failed to get over. Former WCW president Eric Bischoff discussed why Beefcake flopped in the faction on his 83 Weeks podcast, and Bischoff had a rather brutal yet honest take on the matter. But now you've got Ed Leslie portraying a character within the context of the NWO and the more reality-based presentation that we were assigning to that, and he didn't have it. Ed Leslie as a performer was a very, very weak performer. He was great at being the barber, but he didn't have the talent or the instinct to adapt and to embrace a character that would appeal to that 18 to 49 year old demo. It was classic square peg round hole and it didn't work and we were forced. And number one, Stevie Ray. Stevie Ray's involvement in the NWO faction could have worked if the fans wanted to see Ray in a prominent role on TV, but that simply wasn't the case. When Harlem Heat disbanded, Booker T had a genuine organic connection with the fans and he rose to new heights as a babyface, whilst Ray just wasn't that interesting or engaging as a single star. Ray discussed in an interview with the Grew Room show exactly what went wrong with the NWO, and Ray claimed that the issue was that WCW kept adding non-believable acts like Marcus Bagwell. One thing about it, they didn't keep it as serious as they should have kept it. We shouldn't have had f***s in the group. People like Marcus Bagwell, who's scared of him? That's when you start to water down things. In relation to why WCW kept adding more and more nonsensical members to the group, the original plan according to names such as Eric Bischoff were for WCW to introduce a brand split. This obviously never materialized and it would have been hard to execute effectively if one show was dominated by heel members of the NWO faction. But there you have it folks, 10 of the most useless NWO members of all time. Be sure to leave your comments down below and I'll see you next time with some more wrestling content.